if you want to proceed to court, you're going to have to actually particularise what it is you're claiming. You know, it's all well and good to claim defamation, market manipulation, conspiracy, but on the defamation side of it, what was defamatory? <laughs> to be sitting down today with Matt Earl of Shadowfall Research. Matt is Europe's best known short seller and he's intimately involved in the complete craziness that was Wirecard. Uh, today he publishes on companies that are listed in France, which I'd, I'd love to talk about as well, uh, as well as other parts of Europe. So I'm um, really happy to have Matt. Uh, it's our first time speaking. So thanks for doing this, Matt, and, and welcome. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Carson. Very nice to meet you, too. What you do today, if I understand correctly, you're, you're somewhat of a hybrid. And I think that in and of itself is interesting. You have a subscription research service, but then you also take some of the reports and you publish them openly. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, we're not, we don't publish all our research. Um, we, we generally take a view on three reasons as to whether or not we're going to publish something. I mean, one is on occasion, if it's, do we think there's a strong public interest element to it? You know, an example of that I would give would be, as you're familiar with, IQE, the company based in UK, where they formed a joint venture with a university here that it looked like they were gouging the eyes out of the university. So we thought that was a pretty uh, strong public interest element to that story. Another reason would be, you know, do we think that the the investment argument around the, the stock is very one-sided, as is often the case, um, given the number of sell-side covering analysts that will have buy recommendations on the companies. And then thirdly, you know, at the end of the day, we are a commercial organisation and it helps to, to advertise our products now and again um, to get some incoming traffic. So th those are the three reasons as to whether or not we publish, but we don't publish any, everything. You know, and it's, it's really interesting uh, to me, something that you said a moment ago about you one of the factors that you consider when you decide to publish openly is whether the narrative around the company is very one-sided and what's interesting to me is that you sit in europe and the uk still uh, i believe has the market abuse regulation framework of the eu and you publish on companies that i think are almost exclusively are covered by mar i'm sure you're aware we had a situation in France uh, with Casino Guichard that almost four years to re resolve with um, the AMF, which ultimately decided not to do anything. One of the theories that people within the AMF had was that because we had come out and made really, a, our, our piece was a counter narrative, you know, they said that this didn't meet the standards for investment recommendations because it wasn't impartial or it didn't present positive facts. And again, this view, that view did not carry the day uh, when all was said and done, but I was just kind of aghast at this, this interpretation that somebody presenting that counter narrative is obligated to actually represent the narrative. And I'm curious as to whether that's something you've thought about and, um, yeah, and really your view on it. Yeah, Europe's obviously a big place, and I think certain regulators are um, take different stances on how they apply the regulation. I mean, first of all, the regulation is actually, in my view, pretty ambiguous in, in terms of the MAR uh, regulations, yeah. and, and it's open to interpretation. And I don't for one second actually believe that it was ever uh, legislated and set up in mind with targeting short sellers. Um, I think it's for other individuals in financial markets to do with kind of you know, investment bank research, but also um, the libel markets, FX markets and things like that. So the problem is, is that because it is quite subjective in places, it's, it's beholden upon the regulator as to how they want to uh, apply that. Um, and so I think that amongst the regulators, the FCA, for example, in the UK, they uh, I think take a, a more laid back approach to it and think that um, you know, as long as you're not overstepping the mark in terms of pr producing something that is 
false and misleading, then that's fine. And as long as you obviously disclose your conflict of interest there as well, um, that you might be short the stock, that's fine. Whereas I think in places on, on the continent, um, particularly in France and, and as you, <laughs> you might get on to Germany, the regulators there, I think, are very quick to take the side of the companies and they see it as an attack on, on a company um, rather than actually the, the critic, if you like, being able to add something, a better understanding of the investment case around the company. You bring up a really interesting point there about Europe that um, has been a source of frustration for us um, in dealing with both France and Germany, and that is how MAR is drafted. And you're right, it's very vaguely written. And I used to be a lawyer in China for a U.S. firm. The Chinese Communist Party deliberately writes laws that are highly subjective because at the end of the day, they want to, they enforce for political reasons often, and they want to have some text to which they can point and say, well, you ran afoul of this. And basically, it's highly subjective text that they can claim almost anybody or anything ran afoul of. And so when I read Mar, that's what I see. And I, I suspect that wasn't the intention. And I, I suspect, but I'd be curious to hear your views as somebody who sits in Europe and, and deals with this regularly. It's the result of the European lawmaking process where a lot of people have a seat at the table and I just kind of imagine that, you know, they probably want to make everybody feel heard. So, you know, somebody who's from a relatively small country and did a semester in the U.S. for their Ph.D., you know, wants to contribute and they don't want to make that person feel bad and diss them like Ali G did, you know, with crap countries. And so they say, yeah, you know, fine, we'll put that in there. I mean, maybe that's an overly cynical and somewhat coming. <laughs> well, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think that's probably uh, reminiscent of most of European legislation, to be honest. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I, I, the problem with it is, is that, as we said, it, it's, it's very ambiguous and vague. I mean, they even have terms where they don't actually define notions as well. So they will talk about it, where it would be applicable to, to you know, short activists and short sellers in Europe. Um, it would be that they, they have a... a a term called recognised market commentator. They don't actually define what a recognised market commentator is, and how do you, how does one know if one's a recognised market commentator? For a start, how do you become one? Um, does why does that necessarily preclude you from having an opinion and a voice in order to articulate that opinion? Do you become recognised, for example, from being right more often than you're wrong? If so, why do you get punished for being right more often? Um, if you're wrong, well no one seems to care. The market would, will certainly forget about you quite quickly, well, I would imagine, and you'll be kind of consigned to the dustbin of short-selling history. But how it originated, um, and I'm not entirely sure in terms of you know, who was pitching in and, and who wasn't, but it, it came about, I think, mid-2016. And it's, the other issue is, is, of course, it's never really been tested properly um, through the courts. So there's no actual precedence in terms of being able to see how this thing has been applied once thing, if things have been uh, developed into a, a court proceeding. Part of the arguments that we made when we looked at how um, again, some people at the AMF wanted to apply more was that, well, that conflicts with um, the European Charter of Human Rights, which guarantees freedom of expression. Yeah. And I think the, the European, continental European comeback to that is, well, but you're commenting on businesses, not politics. And the real world comeback to that is, what's the fucking difference? You know, look at 2008, a bunch of companies, markets melted down, and millions of people across the world lost their livelihoods, lost homes. It seems like there's, you know, when, when they take that view there seems to, you know, there seems to be this this wall in their mind between the political realm and the business realm. And look, I've been, you know, I've been alive long enough to know that there's really very little separation there. So it's uh, it's it's an interesting environment that you uh, you know that you have to navigate. Yeah, I mean, the other aspect of it is, of course, is that we have much stronger, stringent defamation laws as well. So. Um, you know, it's one thing contending with, I think, a, a, a on occasion, a regulator that um, is quite quick to shoot the messenger um, rather than actually have a, try and look into what the messenger is, is saying. 
Um, it's the other aspect, which is that, you know, again, with regards to the freedom of speech laws over here, they're vastly inferior to, to those that you guys enjoy in the United States, um, which is a shame, I think, but um, you know, that's never going to change, I don't think, and I don't hold, hold I hope that that will, will ever change. Um, right. So that's the other thing. When I look at it, almost every single activist short seller, and you know, I, I wouldn't, even though it's not your, not your sole business model or not to the extent it is mine, but I would include you in that group, almost every single one sits in the United States. I think you and your, your former partner, Fraser Perring, are the only two who are not, at least who you know, continue to publish, who are not situated in the United States. You know, look, I got to say, that's, you know, ballsy, man. Like, a lot of respect to you for, uh, you know, for dealing, for doing yeah, this, well, you know, based on where you not, sit. <laughs> be much sunnier climbs as well to go to than the UK um, in terms of climate. But uh, my wife was never going to let us leave the country, I don't think. So um, we're stuck here and we have to put up with the framework and the, the remit that we, with the environment we find ourselves in. I mean, with the, with the defamation side of it, you know, we have to be much more careful with our language as well. So you know, it, it, it does, I think, give a different style to the research that we put out in that we, have, we don't really put much opinion or, or a, any opinion that we have is heavily caveated that that is our opinion. We can't use words like the big F um, in our research. <laughs> Uh, or, or, or even target prices, really. Um, right. So it does, it does make things a little bit trickier. Every time we, we do something in Europe, for years we've referred to the, the process of scrubbing our, um, our writing as wimpification. If these were U.S.-listed companies, you know, I'd, I'd usually pull far fewer punches. So I, mm. I, I definitely understand what you're saying there. You know, we covered... You know, a little bit about Shadowfall and, and just the, um, the difficult waters that you navigate, but I'd love to understand how you got to where you are. I'm a mathematician. I'm minded of a mathematician <laughs> I'm through and through, so I'm interested in getting to the answer and working out how to get to the answer and kind of a scientific way of approaching things, I, I would argue, which is that you, know, you form your hypothesis you go through the process of your research, and then whatever that research outcome is, that's uh, your conclusion as the result of it, not that you form your conclusion at the beginning of the, of the whole process. So um, I started out as an economist at Royal Bank of Scotland when it was, I guess, uh, obviously a much bigger entity before the, the GFC, and I was on the, the trading floor there writing economic essays. And I know that you know, economists are infamous for kind of getting things more wrong than right, I would argue, but I think that there's at least a process there where they're interested in getting to the right conclusion without having any, uh, you know, but through an independent thought process more than anything. And then I went into equity research after that in about 07, 08, and I was just amazed at the, the fact that my approach was very matter of fact in terms of the result is the result and that's the conclusion, not when it would be uh, you know, if I was writing on, say, the recruitment sector, saying that it was all going to implode because the economy is going to fall off a cliff, oh, no, you can't write that because we've got three recruitment companies as corporate clients and we'll lose those. You know, surely people are interested in what's going to happen. It, it was very surprising to me. Um, obviously, I was much younger, much much greener, very naive. Uh, so out of all, uh, in so that. that's actually really, you know, sorry to uh, interrupt, but that's actually really interesting because... One of the themes on zeros that pops up from time to time, of course, is the the bias of sell side research. But I had never thought that actually the macro stuff was really impacted by uh, the investment banking uh, or the nature of the investment bank business. But I hadn't thought of that with you know with this well type of yeah. you just described. Yeah, I mean the macro stuff wasn't so much in terms of you you could you could separate them. You, it's very all fun and good to say the economy is going to fall off a cliff, but you couldn't then draw the conclusion that that was going to impact on the recruitment companies and see a decimation of their profits. And it was similar to other companies as well. So it was a big eye-opener. And ultimately, I got very frustrated with it. I switched banks uh, to go to a, another rival investment bank where they gave me a bit of a freer reign. And one of the first companies that I, I had a sell report on was this company, not a huge company, it was about $700 million market cap company. Everyone loved this company. It was a, it was a 
company called Connaught PLC, which was, it did social housing repair and maintenance. And I looked at it, it just seemed as though it had red flag after red flag after red flag. I put this all in a research note as a sale recommendation, thinking no one would pay particularly much attention to it. And all hell broke loose when the share price collapsed by 20% or so, volume through the roof. Institutions phoning me up, telling me they'd always suspected there was something wrong with the company. Next call would be, your career in the city's over. Um, you've made a monumental error. <laughs> <laughs> Panic set in because I thought, Christ, maybe my career is over before it's even begun. You know, I mean, just wanted to ask you there because you had basically, you had recently come from, you were doing macro research and then you know, strategy, sector, industry, writing, to all of a sudden you're saying this company has red flags. Um, yeah. I mean, were those more fundamental based red flags or I mean, did you just smell that um, there was something more nefarious going on? And, you know, yeah. I, and I'm just I'm just kind of if, if it's the latter, I'm I'm just curious as to what prepared you for that, given that you really weren't trawling those waters beforehand. Well, I, I wouldn't say I was prepared. I mean, I, I, you know, I kind of stumbled into it and just a lot of things didn't make sense. I mean, there was ultimately there was about six or seven things that didn't make sense with this company. First of all, they, they started bidding for contracts 30, 40% below their competitors. Well, you know, why are they doing that? Secondly, it would be things like on the accounting side, suddenly they started over the last few years building up significant long-term receivables where their customers are local authorities and, and councils, which presumably pay on time, and there's no reason for those uh, invoices to be deferred that long. There was another thing where you know, they, they embarked on this enormous software uh, capitalization policy where does that make sense in terms of software development, where their whole business revolves around men in white vans driving around the country fixing broken doors? Probably not. Then you saw management depart quite rapidly and insider sales. So it was, it was a whole combination of things. I think the, the main experience that I learned from that was that the companies can be very aggressive in their response. So, for example, they immediately responded by sending out an email um, saying that I was a mediocre analyst and uh, I've performed a masterful feat of incompetence and got my numbers completely wrong. The other lesson was that you know, your peers in the market will come to the rallying defence of the company. So every other broker under the sun came out with a reiteration of buy recommendation, again saying, you know, I've made a terrible mistake. Ultimately, the company went bust within six months, though. So I had actually got my numbers completely wrong because in the event I was far too optimistic on that. <laughs> um, but uh, through that period, you, know, you, you get a very thick skin. And I think that's, that's one of the key things to uh, certainly developing as a short seller is to obviously be try and hone your skills and be very good at what you're doing and analysing, but also deal with the pressure and work out how to deal with that pressure as well. But, there, there's, some, but there's something else there that also really strikes me with all due, with all due respect the flags that you found were i mean this wasn't stuff you had to dig deeply for right I mean, oh, no. it's pretty self-evident and <laughs> it's you know just that a there was such a large impact for you from you saying these things out loud b there was such an effort to defend the company against these facts why why hadn't anybody said these things out loud before you did I don't know. I mean, well, you know, I think it's a pretty much a classic kind of emperor no clothes moment, really, in that it's pretty blindingly obvious that there's something wrong with this company and it all doesn't add up. Um, and it literally just takes someone to point, point it out. Why people haven't done that in the past? I mean, I, you know, sell side analysts would never do that because they know where their bread is buttered in that um, you know, they don't make much money from trading commissions these days. And, and the fact is the company was relatively acquisitive. The hope would be that they would win that brokership and be able to represent and give advice, M&A advice to that company, which is pretty lucrative. And there's no way you're gonna get on that ticket if you've got a whole recommendation, let alone a sell. Um, I think that you know, the company was pretty much a roaring success. And so there was perhaps denial had set in uh, amongst the institutional investor base, that this this cut there was something wrong with that company, and I guess maybe just a general lack of, of interest in pursuing that that line of thought, maybe across the market. I mean, the other thing was, of course, this was in around two thousand nine, two thousand ten, 
when uh, it, the market had been through a pretty terrible time in 08 and this was seen as quite a defensive company as well so I think that there were a lot of people that thought that it couldn't be there couldn't be anything untoward with that company you know it, it also dovetails with an, an observation I've had about Europe particularly from when when we've done um, campaigns involving European companies and that is I mean we'll put something out whether it's you know casino stroer even IQE. And the response from the sell side is, oh, this is old news. Everybody knew it. But I mean, the stock has done this. And it's just, it, it's so often had us looking around the office at each other saying, well, if this is old news and everybody knew it, then like, why the fuck is there this reaction from us just saying it out loud? I don't think that they're wrong to, when they when they you know when they retort that this was known, but it's just it's this odd game that seems to be played in Europe where you know we'll stay long the stock that we know has problems, you know, and hopefully nobody will say these problems out loud. But as soon as they do, you know, we need to run for the exits. Do you think that's a good read on it, or do you think? There's yeah, no, I, I think that's a very good reflection of, of matters. I mean, the, it, it, a game I would argue is very much what it is. The, the, frustrating thing I find is that kind of the responses are the same every time. It's it's the fact that it's a regulated institution, so how can it be crooked? Um, the, the, the accounts have been signed off by an auditor, so how can they be funky? The management are related, but that means it's, it's managed like a family-run business, which is good. Um, <laughs> it's... It's it's always the same response. It's same responses to any criticism, and people don't seem to think that. Well, you know, a lot of time and effort in terms of researching the company, and huge amounts of company. There's a whole screening process involved, and ultimately, it's it's come down to this particular company where someone's been prepared to to stand up and point at it and say, "Look, this doesn't really make much sense. This this in the accounts isn't quite right, or there's there's inconsistencies here." It, it's seems to be the same every time. Um, and you know the responses that are going to be made as well. You know, the, I call them bravado buyers, where if, never mind the fact that the management have been selling in droves stock in the, the past year or so, as soon as there's a short report come out or some criticism labelled at the company, they buy a little bit of stock. And everyone says, well, how can it be a fraud because they're buying equity in the business? Okay, fine, but... That pales into insignificance compared to what they've disposed of in the years past. It also somewhat um, echoes our experience. Um, I think it was back in 2013, 2014, we were looking at a few companies that were listed on AIM. So one of them was Africa Minerals. You know, we saw just these ridiculous red flags that you didn't have to look that hard for, but, you know, claiming that they were losing, I think, 20, 25 million dollars a year to fuel theft. You know, and you just think, well, how many trucks must that be driving out of the complex every night that you've been unable to stop? I mean, just the, the background of the guy who uh, was the controlling shareholder, he was a convicted heroin trafficker, and he'd been banned from one exchange and censured by another. And so we, we talked about, well, should we do something on Africa Minerals? And, you know, our view is that well, it's just like it's basically first page of search returns how fucked up this company is everybody must know that must know this you know they must accept it and st and you know and still think it's worth over a billion us and then alphaville started writing about it and just putting some of these things out there and it was profound it's like the stock would just you know do this every time alphaville put the stuff out there and we were thinking well that's strange and then we saw another one um keystone golf port oh yeah yeah, yeah. i mean claiming that in Kurd the Kurdistan region of Iraq, they had well over a trillion dollars worth of reserves. And this thing was north of a billion dollar market cap. And we were thinking, okay, everybody must know that, you know, I mean, the, all these red flags about the company, you know, in addition to the, you know, trillion plus dollar reserves. But then I think it was Alphaville event, again, started publishing on it and just the air came out of it. So we were looking at each other and by we, I mean, primarily um, my now partner, uh, Freddie, who's also a Brit. And we were wondering, what's going on with Europe? 
how do they not know this? You know, and, and the final straw for us was um, Abengoa. It was obviously a problematic company. And then that imploded. So we were really wondering, what is it about Europe? And, you know, the, the kind view that we take is um, it's a very clubby um, environment and people just don't do that thing about, you know, asking uh, these company managers uncomfortable questions. Mm. The less kind environment and this is Freddie, you know, our resident European saying that he just thinks Europeans are a lot more lazy than uh, non-Europeans are when it comes to looking at their investments. It's, I, I, yeah, I think it's a whole range of things. I mean, I think I certainly think there's a lot of laziness at the institutional level amongst European investors. And I think there's general apathy. And I agree that there's, there's not much work that goes into this other than meeting management and believing everything they tell them or every six months that they meet them or every quarter whenever they meet them. I think there's also, on occasion, there's kind of a herd mentality to it as well. I mean, I remember Quindell, which was quite a spectacular bust in the UK, which it just kept going up and up and up, this company. And it was run by a guy called Rob Terry, who by no means did he win uh, first prize in Charisma at all. He, he, everyone that met him came out of the meeting thinking they couldn't understand a word that he was saying in terms of <laughs> describing the business. But the way that he, he told the story and the narrative of it, it sounded like the best product in the world or the best, best service in the world. And the mentality was, yeah, this thing's going up, but I'll be out of it, it after it's gone up 40%. And I'll leave some for the next man and, and uh, I'll, be, I'll be out before it starts to unwind. And of course, suddenly there's a moment where someone does stand up and say, and he's with Gotham in this, in this instance, say, stands up and says, the, there's deep fundamental issues to this business, and it's not actually uh, as it's portrayed. That everyone suddenly en masse kind of says, "Oh yeah, shit. Okay, <laughs> let's let's get out of this," and it just collapses. It, I, you know, each one's slightly different, I think. But above all, I would I would share your view on um, on kind of the, the mentality of most long only European investors. Sorry to for that digression, but uh, it it just seemed an opportune time to ask you some questions that I, I often do ask about uh, about the environment in Europe. But um, yeah, so from from that first from that first sell report at an investment bank, yeah. then what happened next? Yeah, so then um, I went to another shop, which was fun whilst it lasted. And, and I left there in about 20 end of 2010, 2011, pretty just frustrated, really, in terms of the research at an investment bank level wasn't how I would view research should be. So I started trading my own capital, uh, which I did from 2011 onwards, but obviously still doing research. And I used to write a blog, which is still up, called Lordships Trading, and used to write some ideas on there. And it got a reasonable following behind the blog, amongst hedge funds, institutions, press. Just would put up my ideas on there, and, and mainly it was mainly short ideas. I'd say about 80% short. And we just do that. Did that for about the next what, five or six years or so, um, until then, 2015 started looking at Wirecard, uh, and then in 2016 still looking at Wirecard, and then late 2016 started to form Shadowfall as it stands today. 